prepare our cells for worship and begin with prayer. Let's pray. Lord, there's a lot of reasons that we're in this room right now. Some may be to be intentional about our worship. Some may be a place that we come to for comfort. Some of us is maybe kind of respite from the rest of the world for just a few hours. But Lord, for whatever reasons we come into your sanctuary today, we pray that you fill our hearts and our minds and our very souls with the right reasons for worship. That you present yourself, you give us a way to interact with you today, to see you. Pray for your Holy Spirit to move about this very room. We pray for you to open us up, Lord, mind, body, and soul to your word. And especially, Lord, as we look through this service to communion, that you allow our hearts to be prepared for a communion. That if we're sitting here through this time with unrepentant hearts or things we need to ask forgiveness for, that you would gently move us, that you would direct us, you would call us, and you would position us in a posture of humility before you today, we pray. In your name, amen. A few weeks ago, as we were driving to church, my family and I, I overheard my um, daughter, Campbell, ask her sisters, you know, when we go to church, it's kind of interesting, we can't see out the windows, right? The windows are all stained. And she was wondering, why is that? Why can't we see out the windows? And then she answered her own question. She told her sisters, I think that the church is really a spaceship. And that when we are worshiping, when we're singing and praising, the spaceship actually takes off into space. And if you could look out the windows, everybody would panic. So that's why the windows are staring. And then she suggested to her sisters, you know what, I bet in the middle of the sermon, if we snuck out, we could tether ourselves with ropes to the church, open the doors, and start floating around. I, I mention this because I think it actually highlights three really important aspects of worship. Um, first of all, in worship, we actually are able to come together on Sundays and turn away from the distractions of life. We get to turn away from all of that noise in our lives and focus on God. And it's not just the windows. It's the songs of praise. It's the prayers. It's the readings. It's the sermons. All of those things allow us to focus on God. Second of all, in worship, we actually don't go anywhere. We don't fly off into space. Something more amazing happens. God comes down to us. In worship, we praise the one who comes down from heaven and enters into our world. He comes here to rescue us in Jesus Christ. And finally, in worship, it gives us a time to look at our tether to God. 
we get to examine our tether to God, and we can remove that slack. Because after worship, as we float around in our lives, we can have peace and confidence that that tether, that our rope to God is held securely through Jesus Christ, that God will not let go of us. So come and let us worship our Lord and Savior. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. And also with you. Please rise if you are able. <laughs> Acknowledge the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We're his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. Please turn to your hymn, and our opening hymn is hymn number 20. All people that on earth do dwell. <laughs> shepherd. He cares for me always. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He provides me rest in rich green fields beside streams of refreshing water. He soothes my fears. 
He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He makes me whole again, steering me off worn, hard paths to roads where truth and righteousness echo his name. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Even in the unending shadows of death's darkness, I am not overcome by fear, because you are with me in those dark moments. Near with your protection and guidance, I am comforted. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. You spread out the table before me, provisions in the midst of attack from my enemies. You care for all my needs, anointing my head with soothing, fragrant oil, filling my cup again and again with your grace. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Certainly your faithful protection and loving provision will pursue me where I go, always, everywhere. I will always be with the eternal Lord in your house forever. Please rise if you are able.
Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. and you are there as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And Lord, you give us joy in knowing that you are always there. And let that joy, Lord, be evident in all that we do, in our lives, in our praise, in our prayer, and in our offerings to you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I will now ask the ushers to come forward to collect the offering. If you are new here or a visitor, please feel under no obligation to give. Your presence here is a gift.
David. The Lord is my shepherd. He gives me everything I need. He lets me lie down in fields of green grass. He leads me beside quiet water. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths for the honor of his name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. You are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff comfort me. You prepare a feast for me right in front of my enemies. You pour oil on my head. My cup runs over. I am sure that your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. So if you take your bulletin, there's a few things happening today. Um, first, we have the second part of an informational meeting for those interested in membership. That's happening downstairs after church. Then we're also having a mission fair um, where you'll have a chance to interact with the advocates, is what we call them. Those are the members or friends of our church who help to facilitate information from the missions that we support to the congregation. So we have missions that are part of missions, and then we have mercy ministries. And there's an entire list on our website of all the missions and the ministries that we are a part of in the church, which include things like Young Life and InterVarsity and mission trips to Haiti um, and a lot more. So take a moment to to go downstairs and you don't have to grab a snack, but it'll be happening during coffee hour. And if you can't, take a moment, look on the website, um, because the focus of our church is to do that outreach, to do that mission. And not all of us are intimately involved in a mission, but we can pray for every single one of those on the list, which is a great way to interact and to support and to help. So again, take a moment. We've been working our way through Psalms. Last week we heard a phenomenal sermon by Dale on Psalm 11. Uh, Dale's our executive minister for the region. I kept thinking all week about his Annie Dillard quote, that if you want, Annie Dillard, remember that quote he talked about last week, that if you want to have God show up, it's not this sweet little passive thing you really need to be wearing a crash helmet and a seatbelt. I loved that. Because how often, that is so true. God just storms in, takes our world and shakes it up. So last week we did Psalm 11. Uh, this week, as you've heard from song that we have sung and the various translations and versions, we are in Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a well-known song. Most of us can recite it by heart. It is a psalm that is a favorite because it is a very user-friendly psalm. It's a psalm that's about God's care for us as the good shepherd. It's a psalm about what it means to walk through grief. It's a psalm about what it means to have a posture of humility and reverence for the Lord. It's a psalm I use at every funeral, at every graveside. It's a psalm that at any point you can open it up and you're going to get something out of it. You're going to be able to engage in worship in, in a way that is um, inspiring and, a, again, a posture of humility, a posture of right reverence from the Lord. But one of the things I think about Psalm 23 that often gets overlooked is that it is a Christological psalm. Most of the psalms that David wrote are Christological in intent. You know, whether David truly understood the, the depth of the Messiah or not, Dave, Jesus comes from David's line. So it would make sense that David's kind of pushing that out. This is a Christological psalm. This will be picked up by the Lord, and Jesus will refer back to it and put himself as the shepherd. He will refer to the Lord as our shepherd and himself as our shepherd. So it's Christological. But another thing I think that gets missed is that it is missional. 
as well. It is a psalm about what it means to have a posture of living out God's intent for our lives, for the world, through everything that we do. One of the things that we are called to be as Christians is, um, as a disciple, is it going in and out? Is to be and to create disciples. Good thing I don't use notes, right? It would be a little distracting. Um, we're called to be disciples. We're called, and what we, we use this word discipleship, we use this word evangelism as um, large words that carry a lot of weight with them and things that we're to do. And part of how we're to be disciples and to be evangelists in the world is through the lens of missions. And missions is another one of those large terms that mean anything um, related to the gospel. Ways that we preach and teach. Ways that we're hands and feet of Jesus Christ in the world. Sometimes, sometimes when we talk about missions, we talk about it as a noun. And we talk about what it means to have... There we go. We talk about what it means to... Um, support something, or sometimes go to far off places. And that is an aspect of missions. But there's also a part of missions that is living out what it means to be missional. And that means maybe we're not going off to some far off locale. Maybe God has us in a field right now to use everything that he's endowed us with and given us as gifts to promote the gospel to help other people make their lives better, to be his hands and feet into the world, to do what Jesus said, that what we do to others in Jesus' name, we do to Jesus and for Jesus. This subtle difference between what it means to be missional versus just missions um, is the difference, I would say, between agriculture and permaculture. Woo! We get to talk a little soil for just a little bit. If you're sitting there going, what in the world is permaculture? I've never heard that word. Um, permaculture was a, a term coined by someone by the name of Bill Moylson in 1978. So I would define missions as agriculture and being missional as permaculture. I'm gonna give you the definition Bill Moylson wrote of, of what it means to have permaculture. He said this, uh, permaculture is the conscious design and maintenance of agriculturally productive systems, which have the diversity, the stability, the resilience of natural ecosystems. It's the harmonious integration of the landscape with people providing their food, energy, shelter, and other material and non-material needs in a sustainable way. What permaculture does is it takes that word, um, permanent, in the first part of permaculture, and it showcases the stability of an ecosystem. So permaculture takes a natural surrounding, and it does more than just agriculture. Agriculture is part of permaculture, but it takes a natural ecosystem, and it tries to mimic it um, in a, what's called a closed-looped ecosystem in man-made areas. So permaculture will be agriculture, hydrology, water conservation, animal husbandry, um, biodiversity, community development, and economics. And so in mimicking these natural closed looped ecosystems, the point of permaculture is to have no waste. Okay, so in agriculture, you use something for one thing. Sometimes we'll have crop rotations, but one plot of land would be used for crops, right? We grow corn here, we grow soybeans here. You would not typically have animals then the next year on that plot because you use that one area for corn. When the corn's mowed down, you allow that land to rest for a year, but you're not going to move something onto it. Permaculture says nothing should be wasted 
And so we need to have that closed loop ecosystem where you allow for something to have multiple purposes. So permaculture will work like this. You have a rain barrel, rains all the time, in theory, and the rain barrel catches the rain. You can use that rain to water your plants or to feed your animals, but you can also take that rain barrel and use it as an aquatic planter. Or some people will modify their rain barrels to put fish in there, mimic what a pond would look like, and raise fish using the water. Um, sometimes it means allowing for uh, intentional implementation of perennials instead of simply annuals so that you cut down on tillage, or you'll allow part of your land to be used for forest so that you cut down again on tillage and crop rotations and you allow for it to, to naturally um, be utilized for what it's intended for. Okay, so we get to play the game. Ready for this? What does Psalm 23, missional living, and permaculture have in common? Dun, dun, dun. An invitation to worship God that allows us to look at where we are planted and to see how God uses every aspect of our life with nothing wasted, all for his glory and for his creation. So the idea of Psalm 23 as a missional psalm is, is showcasing for us what it means to be in this invitation, uh, in, in worship of God that allows for nothing in our life to be wasted. We're going to look at Psalm 23 through those lenses of the four pillars that we've been talking about, covenant, commitment, communal, and call. So let's go back to Psalm 23 and let's start with communal. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in, in worship, especially of the Psalms, is this idea that there is a duplicity in worship all the time. And you see this showcased in the Psalms, and the duplicity in worship is this. We come before God as individuals, but we do not worship God in isolation. So in a moment, when we walk forward for communion, we will be walking forward before God in isolation um, as independent individuals, but we will not be walking forward in isolation without other people around us. So we come before God as individuals, but we worship God in community. And you see this in the Psalms. There's this duplicity in the plural as well as in the singular of the Psalm. And you see this in Psalm 23, this communal aspect of worship. So look at the first verse, please. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. He understands that he is coming before the Lord as an individual. But David is a shepherd himself. And a shepherd knows they do not have one sheep in their flock. No shepherd in the ancient world would waste their time on one sheep. You have a flock of sheep. So David is understanding as he's personalizing God, the Lord is my shepherd, he understands that he's part of a flock. He's part of a bigger picture. He understands that while he's part of a flock, God knows him individually. We don't worship a deistic God. We don't worship a God who created the heavens and went away and is now sitting in an armchair watching football. We worship a God who is intimately involved in our lives, who knows every single one of his sheep by name. David says the Lord is my shepherd. This Lord Adonai, Yahweh in Hebrew, is personal name for Lord. He's not saying this great shepherd is this unknown, mysterious deity that I've never met. He says, no, I know the personal name of my shepherd. And my shepherd knows my personal name. David understands the communal aspect of what it means to be in a flock. And this great king, former little boy shepherd, is putting himself not in the role of shepherd in this psalm, but as the role of a sheep. Look at verse 2. The Lord, as our shepherd, makes us lie down in green pastures. I love the King James. He maketh me. I love that. It's so beautiful. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. What David is saying about the Lord as his shepherd and himself as a sheep is that he, like everybody else, doesn't know how to take care of themselves. 
Sheep cannot voice their concerns and their needs in discernible human language. A shepherd has to know instinctively how to take care of their sheep. They have to know where to take them for green pastures. They have to know how to feed them, how to give them water, and how to make them rest. And so David is putting himself in a posture of humility in saying, I am a sheep. My shepherd knows me intimately. And he knows that I don't know how to take care of myself. And he has to make me lie down in green pastures. This green pastures is the verdant pastures that you would go into where it's just open season and everything is lovely. Um, Caden this summer put our calves on paddock rotations because we quickly found out that calves are like children and they will only eat the good stuff. So they're not going to go for the very healthy weed in the corner. <laughs> they're going to go for the red clover first. And so restricting them on paddock, because we don't have a lot of land, made them eat every single bit of grass. And when he was getting towards the end of the paddock rotation, they had to work for it. They had to get up, they had to move around, they had to look for it, it wasn't gonna be brought to them. But then when he would open up a new paddock for them, it was like Christmas. They didn't have to work for it. They could just sit there and ruminate all day and they had a buffet at their hoops. That is what David is saying when he is in these green pastures. That God knows there are some times where we need to be forced down to rest and where we need to have the food kind of brought to us. But this make it, rabax in Hebrew, it sounds so sweet. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. But this is a, a hithbil in verb stem which means that outside action is acting upon the subject. It is a causative tense in Hebrew. So unlike an imperative, which is a command, in imperative voice, you at least have the option to say no. It might get you in the belly of a whale like Jonah, but you could say no. But in the hip bill stem, you don't have an option to say no because the action is acting upon you. So what the Lord is saying, and he maketh me lie down in green pastures, is the image of how I was forced to take a nap as a child. I was lovingly held down until I fell asleep. Because I was the child who, as soon as my mom or dad would leave the room, I would leave the room. And so this idea of rabat is the make. Um, it's not the make or do in Hebrew word. It's the make as in crouch down low and put close to the ground. And the idea is that something is holding you down. It's God. So David, this great king, this military conqueror is saying, I am a weak little sheep who doesn't know how to get my food and my water. And oh, by the way, I need someone to push my head down because I will not rest unless I'm forced. That doesn't sound so sweet, does it? Who wants to be made to rest? Oh, I don't know. You guys all uh, saw last week that uh, two weeks on Tuesday I cut my hand. I was shutting a door in our house that requires a stern push, and I was irritated that night, so I gave it an extra stern push. <laughs> Um, I've repented of that anger, and the, the glass popped out and cut my thumb and my forearm and my wrist. And I, I got a towel pretty quickly and tried to, I was cleaning it out, make sure there was no glass in, and I tried to figure out how deep the cut was because I was trying to determine if I needed to, to go somewhere. And I couldn't determine how deep my thumb cut was, so I, I figured Mara needed to take me to the ER. Totally, because of our lack of, praise the Lord, emergencies in our house, um, forgot about the urgent care. <laughs> so I went into the emergency room, and it was three hours start to finish just to get eight little stitches. I was like, this is ridiculous. So I'm lying on the bed, just completely bemoaning that I have to be there. You know, I could have done this myself at home or or all the things that I'm trying to figure out that I'm gonna need to be doing when I get home, like the dishes 
and the lunches and putting kids to bed. And then my mind starts to race to um, all the things I'm not going to be able to do because my dominant hand is going to be out of commission for at least seven to 10 days. Um, three hours in the ER to me is a colossal waste of time. It is not a vacation. And so I'm lying there and I'm thinking, um, and by the way, Maren went with me, but she went out of Dodge the second we went into the emergency room because people were coughing and she's like, I'm in a hazmat suit in the, in the, so I'm by myself in this room. And I remember that someone had prayed at prayer two days before um, that we would be allowed to be still enough to spend time with God. And so my anger and frustration quickly turns to, oh, my Lanta, am I being made to lie down in green pastures? Right? Oh, no, thank you. I got up the next day, I went to work. Um, I had uh, all the stuff that I typically do that I am not going to relinquish because our house is created and designed to run like a Roman camp. But I'm, I'm feeding getting out breakfast for the kids, and I, I feed a G-tube dependent kid with a syringe, right? No, I do not need help, Mitch, I can do it. I'm changing a diaper, which I have diaper efficiency, where I can change a diaper like Daisy Duke can fix a carburetor in the dark. I can do it blindfolded in 10 seconds or less, but with my hands out of commission, I look like I was wrestling a gator with my non-dominant hand. It took me 10 minutes to change it. 10 minutes, of which time I had discussions of his need to be potty trained. I was done. I had to have Mitch drive me to work because my hand hurt so bad I couldn't drive. And so I get to work and the first person I come in contact with, my dear friend, gets just vomited on about my frustration at my weakness. You know, their question was, how are you doing? <laughs> Not good. <laughs> Not good. I can't do anything. And I, I just like exploded on this person. I, I am weak. I do not like being weak. I do not want to ask for help. I do not want this kind of attention. This is ridiculous. And I just went off about how I could have probably sutured myself and Mitch shouldn't have to drive me to work. And this person starts to smile and says, oh good, <laughs> this sounds like an invitation. An invitation? Well, I knew what she meant. Not to a party or to dinner, but from God. An invitation to encounter God more. Every aspect of worship, every aspect of our relationship with God is an invitation. It's an invitation to experience Him more. Worship isn't about just songs and a boring sermon and reading scripture. It's about meeting the living Lord in here. But that invitation does not just end here. It's in every aspect of our life. Just like in permaculture, if we're going to be in closed-looped ecosystems where God has us placed and nothing is wasted, that means even our weakness. Do I think God cut my hand to slow me down? No. Do I think God used my stillness for his glory? Absolutely. When we're in communion with other people, when we're being missional, then part of that is the understanding that we need to model rest. I really have not evolved past that little girl who needs to be held down to take a nap. But when we rest, when we give in to that, then we say to the Lord, I trust you with my world. I trust that you can handle the things that I think I have to handle all the time. When we rest, when we take a Sabbath, then we understand and we explain to the world, we model for the world what it means to be trusting God as our shepherd to bring the food to us. I had a choice. I could continue to rail against and just sound like a giant diaper baby for two weeks, or I could lean into that invitation. I kept thinking about that invitation in my prayer time for several days. Lord, what do you want me to do during this time. It meant a couple of days of, of very little productivity. But when we understand the slowness of our world, we understand not only our dependency upon God as our shepherd, 
but our dependency upon one another. When I am made weak, it gives me tremendous empathy for the weakness in other people. But look at the continuation of verse 2. God doesn't just bring our food to us. He leads us beside still waters. You've seen from several of the Tanner paintings, one is behind me, that the topography, the cliff side in Judean hillside was rather um, tenacious and trepidatious areas because you had ravines and hills and caves and there were lots of places for sheep to fall off. You also would never, ever, ever have had your sheep drink from running water in the Judean hillside because sometimes the speed of that water was way too fast and the sheep would fall in. So what you would do is you would, if you were in a stationary place of a field, you would have what's called a shepherd's cup and the shepherd would bring the water to the sheep. Wells in the ancient world had a pulley system very different than ours and it was, it was very difficult to maneuver. And so the shepherd would put themselves in a position of, to make sure that the, the sheep were safe and drinking. So he leads me beside still waters is David, this great shepherd, acknowledging his weakness as a sheep, his dependency upon God as the shepherd, and his willingness to model that weakness for other people around him. Okay, next up call. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. Um, we have a call on our lives. We know that. We have a call that may mean um, our vocation. It may mean our geography. It may mean our families. It may mean where God wants us, you know, in two days. But we have a call in our lives. And often throughout the Old Testament, that call is a directional statement, meaning God has us moving somewhere. Maybe not necessarily moving in geography, but moving in spiritual development. Jesus will pick that up. And Jesus will say we have a call on our lives. And his call, he says, for us as his disciples is to follow him, right? That's the call that we have. It is a directional statement. And you see in verses 3 and 4, three words that are directional words. Um, you have shub, which is restores. You have leads, nacha. And then you have yalak, which is walk. These are directional words. What does that mean? It means that God is moving us to places. It may not mean moving from Middlebury to Addison. It may not mean a physical geographical move. But this means that it's not this plateau aspect of our faith with the Lord. The Lord is always moving us closer and closer to him. It's a call that we have. Now, sometimes... Being missional means that God's call on our lives will be to go to other places. Like Anur Adam Judson, who went to India. Or Eric Little, who had a call to go to China. Or Mother Teresa, who had a call to go to Calcutta. That is part of the call. It could be a geographical call. But more often than not, just like in permaculture, God has you in a mission field right now. Right now. And in verse 3 and 4... Part of that call is to be able to listen to God's voice, to, to, to sense and to hear his direction and his movement. So he leads me by still waters. He restores my soul. Part of being a sheep to a shepherd is you had to actually follow the voice of your shepherd so that you knew where to go. But David says this following the voice of our shepherd is not just to get us from point A to point B. It is to bring glory to God for his righteousness, for his name's sake. He leads me. Then also part of this call is a restoration of us. He restores my soul. In Hebrew, it is he refreshes my breath. Soul and breath are the same word in Hebrew, ruha. Sounds like breath, doesn't it? It's the idea of an animal panting and needing to have its heart rate go down and to be able to breathe normally again. We have a dog named Lexi. She's half um, Labrador, half Australian Shepherd, which means she likes to run and hunt and play, and she likes her pack of boys. And because she's a black dog in the summer, she gets overheated pretty quickly. And not only do we have to force her, not only do we have to make her lay down in green pastures, 
Um, we have to get her to places to restore her breath. Because what she wants to do is continue chasing the pack of boys. But if she does that, she's gonna get overheated. So we have to bring her in, we have to put her in the crate, we have to put her in her den, we have to slow her heart rate down. David is saying, God has to do that to me. God has to put me in places so that I can have restoration. Isn't there an amazing implication in that? We will have times in our lives we will need to be restored. That being a follower of God, being a follower of Jesus Christ, is not this platitude. It's not this everything is wonderful all the time. There's going to be times where we're going to need to have our very breath restored. Why? Look at the next verse, verse 4. Because he takes us, he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. In, in shepherd's terms, and you can see that right there on that Tanner painting, um, these shadows of death um, were sometimes those cliffs that you had to walk along. Sheep are, have dexterity. They're able to walk on cliffs pretty easily. But if you slipped, you fell off. You also were going to encounter all kinds of ravenous wolves. There's all kinds of valleys of shadow of death the sheep are going to walk in. But David knows exactly what this means in his life because he's walked through those valleys of the shadow of death. He goes from conquering Goliath as a little boy with a slingshot, winning the hearts of the Israelites, to next having to live in caves because Saul is chasing him. His life is constantly going through the valley of the shadow of death. Again, the implication here is not that it's all smooth sailing when she starts following the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Truth in advertisement, there are valleys of the shadow of death. It is not a matter of whether we will not be called to walk through those. It's whose voice do we listen to when we're in them? The sheep had to listen to the shepherd to get through them or they would be killed. David had to listen to God through every single one of the valley shadows. He doesn't get to a place where he's a king and all of a sudden he's brilliant and he doesn't need God anymore. Once he passes Kali and the Philistines try to chase him, then he becomes king and his son chases him. Absalom hunts him down. The call upon our lives to listen to God means our voice our, our ears have to be tuned to his voice. What does Jesus say? We need to listen as sheep to the shepherds. Okay, last, or next up, really quickly, commitment. Um, after we get through the valley of the shadow of death, what comforts us is thy rod and staff. But do they? Do they really? <laughs> do you want a rod? A rod and a staff are the same instrument in the ancient world. It's, it's a shepherd's hook. And it was used to show the authority of the shepherd, but it also had four other things that it did. First is it fought off wild animals. That sounds good. The next thing it did was it would hook a sheep that went away by its neck or its feet. Yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that. What does it say about us that we need a hook to bring us back? Lord, I wander, prone to wonder, Prone to leave my happy home, right? So that was the second thing it did. The third thing it did was it would lift back part of the wool and it would check for um, wounds or rashes on the sheep. Wow, how many times does God pull us back to check for scars? And then the last thing it did is it would count the sheep. And this is the commitment part. In the Old Testament, going under the rod is where the shepherd would hold out its rod at the end of the day, and the sheep would come by one by one, and the shepherd would count every single one of the sheep. And if one of those sheep wasn't there, they had to make a choice. Do I risk the others to go find them? Do I have somebody to watch these while I go hunt? What does Jesus say in the parable? God is committed to making sure that every single one of his sheep go under that rod, so he will risk his safety. He will risk everything. He doesn't care if there's 99 in the fold. He will search and hunt you down. Because you're part of his flock. God is committed. He's committed to taking care of us. He's committed to protecting us. He's committed to making sure that we're safe. Isaiah 40, when we walk through fires, God will be with us. That is a commitment. When we are in worship... Not only do we facilitate what it means to tune our ears to God's call, we also remind ourselves of the commitment 
that God has to take care of us. Through reading scripture and through song and through sermon, we are told over and over again, God is committed to this. He's not going to, to let any of us fall. And the last thing, last up, is covenant. David ends this psalm by saying that the Lord sets a table in the presence of his enemy, that his head is anointed with oil and his cup overflows. It's about a covenant. It's a Christological aim towards Jesus and that great banquet that Jesus talks about as the kingdom of heaven, but it's also the idea of restoration in God's kingdom. In the ancient world, when you would have a feast and a banquet, you would anoint the head of the guest or the, the one you're celebrating with oil. David has already had his head anointed with oil by this point because he's become king. You anointed your head with oil as a priest for purification. So though an oil set you apart, it purified you, it restored you. My cup overflowing is a reference back to that shepherd's cup. It means my cup is abundant. It's not just the idea of wine flowing into the cup that we take as a symbol of communion. It's going back to David being the sheep and God being the shepherd and God constantly filling up that bucket so that he can drink. And then the last of the table in the presence of my enemies is David's awareness of the restoration of what it means to be in that banquet with God. Oftentimes when we, we hear that table in the presence of my enemies, we take it to mean some kind of vindication or vengeance. No, absolutely not. It's a covenant. It's a promise of God for restoration. When Jesus talks about the banquet, the kingdom of heaven being like a wedding banquet, the act of that restoration of getting us at that banquet meant that table was set in the presence of his enemies. Jesus knew those words as he died on the cross. It was in the presence of sin that that covenant took place. God is committed to us. He has called us as covenant. And that covenant in missional living means it gets lived out for every one of us to see and to testify to that nothing is wasted, even the bad. Um, a little over a week ago, Andrew Brunson was released from a Turkish prison. Andrew Brunson is a pastor who had been preaching and teaching in Turkey for 23 years. 2016, there was a failed coup attempt against the Turkish government, and Andrew Brunson and his wife were both arrested. They were charged with espionage, and they were put into kind of the bucket of the failed coup. They had nothing to do with the coup. His Wife was released after, I believe, 13 days, and Andrew Brunson was held for two years in a Turkish prison, 18 months of which he had no idea why he was being held. No idea why he was being held. And so he started doing um, talk shows or news outlets, and he was interviewed by CBS last week. And they, they asked him about this political boy um, that he was being used as kind of leverage between the Turkish government and the United States government, and, and whether he felt like he was a ploy and a big plot or not. And his answer to me was astounding. He said this. He said, I have no idea about that stuff. The only view I had was from the prison cell. He said, but whatever reason the Turkish government decided to hold me, I consider it part of God's will. Because he said, think about it, millions of people prayed for Turkey during that time. Millions of people prayed for Turkey. He said, God is doing something there. Nothing is wasted. Even two years in a Turkish prison, nothing is wasted to be able to testify to the covenant. We're going to go into communion. And this communion, this part of the month, is where we get to come forward. If you cannot... We will bring it to you. If you do not want to, we will bring it to you. Do not feel obligated. But as we transition to communion, as we come forward, ask ourselves some questions. How do I testify to the cross? And do I testify like Andrew Brunson that nothing's wasted? Um, where does God have me? Right? Is God making me lie down in green pastures today? And Lord, what, what's your call in my life? Are you asking me to do something different? Are you asking me to move? Are you asking me to change jobs? 
What are you asking me to do? This is where we get to meet the Lord in covenant. Let's pray. Lord, as we transition to your table, a table that you have set in the presence of everyone, Lord, we pray for you to speak to us today. Amen. Join us for the first time. You can come down the center aisle, take communion and the cup and the deacons, and or you can take it back to your seat if you want some more time. Take it up here, you can just place your cup over there. On the night when Christ was crucified, he gathered in the upper room with his disciples. He sat around a beautifully set table prepared in the presence of Israel. And he told them that night that this bread and this cup was for them. It was a sacrifice for all of us to show that restoration and the covenant that God keeps his promises, that Jesus' body was broken for us, and his blood was shed for our freedom. We invite you to come forward.
close in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us that is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Please rise if you are able. And our closing hymn is hymn 460, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Lord, speak for your servants who are listening. Amen. Amen.